Thank you very much for coming out on this filthy night. And thank you, our Zoom audience, for staying in on this filthy night to hear this very important presentation about one of the core businesses in our central city. Um, following on from this year's theme of if business doesn't help us combat climate change, then we may be in the poo because government doesn't always do well and individuals are trying very hard. Tonight, we have Jeremy Key Pugh, who, as you can see from this screen here, is everything to the Abbey and has organized everything since the beginning of time. <laughs> <laughs> and who is now implementing the very important carbon footprint project where he and the other members of the board have promised God and us that the Abbey will be carbon neutral by 2030. I'd like to welcome you very much, but before we put our hands together, could I please ask you to tell me what you'd do if the fire alarm went? Point, please point, sorry. Point, yeah. <laughs> Downstairs, out the front door, turn right out of the building and round to the church, where the green bit in front of the church, and then we'll count you and not send any firemen in to save you when you're not here. And the facilities, ladies, please point. Gentlemen, please point. <laughs> Good, that's the um, housekeeping covered. So Jeremy keep you everything to the Abbey. The Abbey right at the center of our fight against carbon. Over to you, thank you. Good evening. Good evening to the brave souls who are here in person and good evening to those of you joining us online. Lovely to have you with us. Thank you. When I claim, and I do claim, that Bath Abbey is right at the heart of the city of Bath, I don't mean just in some vague sense spiritually, not even simply geographically, though of course that is true as you can see. To illustrate what I do mean, I invite you to consider the city's coat of arms, as well as the representation of the borough wall in the bottom half of the shield, and that of the two sources of water above, the river Avon and the hot spring, there is a sword. And if the image has been drawn carefully enough, along the length of the sword, there is a key. Now, for those of you not intimately familiar with ecclesiastical iconography, I should perhaps explain that the key, or normally keys in the plural, are the symbol of St. Peter, to whom were entrusted the keys of the kingdom of heaven. And the sword is likewise the symbol of St. Paul. Thus, the coat of arms of the abbey the Abbey Church of St. Peter and St. Paul is a cross sword and a pair of keys. Exactly the symbol that is on the lion and the bear on either side of the city's arms. I've taken this example from the Mayor of Bath's website because I don't think you can get more official than that. Furthermore, the same website acknowledges that the crest of the coat of arms depicts the hands of St. Dunstan, Archbishop of Canterbury in the year 973, crowning Edgar, the first king of all the English peoples, right here in the Abbey in Bath. So, for upwards of a thousand years, the Abbey has been at the heart of Bath. So what does that mean in this 21st century? Now, bearing in mind that the word church means both the institution and the individuals who call themselves members or adherents, I believe that being at the heart of the community means that the Abbey and its people should live lives of integrity and as far as possible virtue. And right now, that means taking seriously the need to address the impact of the climate crisis, especially where that impact hits hardest those least able to defend themselves. 
Now, Bath Abbey has two spheres of activity. One revolves around Christian worship, and the other around heritage tourism. Sometimes they coexist happily. As a worshipper, it's lovely to have an exquisite grade one listed building in which to worship. And as a tourist, it's lovely to have things uh, of historical interest to show visitors, some of which are unique even in this historic city. But sometimes those two are uncomfortable bedfellows, such as tourists wanting to come and do their touristy thing on Sundays and special days such as Good Friday, which would impede our work as a parish church of the so far still established Church of England. The footprint project on which most of the work has now been finished involved both strands of our life. And I think I can best illustrate that by explaining how and why the project got that not entirely self-explanatory name. The metaphor of a footprint was chosen in the hope that it might reflect three issues we faced, which were in need of renewal. Now, these images, by the way, are from the specially commissioned artwork, which decorated the walls around the building site while, while the contractors were on the site. In the first place, the name footprint was intended to reflect the aspiration of the congregation of Bath to follow in the footsteps of Jesus Christ. Now, nowadays, that requires more than a simple repetition of age-old liturgies. As a church, we are keen to rediscover our roots in a Benedictine monastery, which from as early as the 8th century until its dissolution in 1539, served the needs of the city in practical as well as spiritual ways. We wished to do more beyond the range of just worship, but to do that, we had to enhance our facilities. For example, we operate a substantial, high-quality music department, which makes a massive contribution to the musical education of about 90 children and young people. And the Footprint Project has provided incomparably better facilities for them. We are keen to offer hospitality to those in need. And without the Footprint Project, we would not have had the facility to provide one of the warm spaces which have been so greatly appreciated across the city this winter. And one of the crossover points between our religious and our heritage activities is our educational offering to parties of school children and adult interest groups. All that we see as what we would call part of our discipleship following the footsteps of Christ. But secondly, footprints are made by feet. And since we discourage climbing on the pews, that greatly affects the abbey floor. So great has been the wear and tear on the floor of the abbey that it has been breaking up and subsiding for several decades. It was the necessity to do something about the floor that was the original impetus for the Footprint Project. And then thirdly, there was the obvious relevance to our carbon footprint. I can make clearer the need for action if I give you a brief overview of some of our history. After the dissolution of the monastery in 1539, and more than 30 years spent wondering what should be done with the unfinished shell of the church, the new owners, the corporation of the city of Bath, decided to make it the great parish church for the city. Now, one of the responsibilities of a parish church is to bury the dead. Unfortunately, Bath Abbey did not have a churchyard. That had been sold off when the monastery was closed down. But it did have space under the floor. And that's because when Bishop Oliver King had his famous dream in 1499, 
and decided to clear away the old Norman cathedral and build a new church, he made the decision to set the floor level of the new church about six feet, that's two meters in modern speak, higher than the floor level of its predecessor. Oh, it had been easy enough to fill in the void. There was all that rubble lying around from the old building. So all you had to do to bury a body in the new church was lift up a floor stone, dig out some of the rubble, pop in the coffin or shroud, and put the flagstone back. And starting in 1573, that's exactly what they did. And more than 7,000 bodies were buried like that under the floor of the abbey. Until in about 1845, it was clear there wasn't room for any more. So the abbey acquired land on the south side of the river to use as a cemetery. But the stability of the floor and what was under it had been compromised. To make matters worse, in the 1860s, a problem with, a with the roof in the nave led to George Gilbert Scott being appointed to oversee improvements. He installed the fan vaulting over the nave, removed the screen dividing the nave from the chancel, and then set about installing heating and seating. For the former, he constructed a boiler house under the east end of the abbey, that's the Orange Grove end, and his men dug trenches under the floor through the burials to take the hot water from the Victorian boiler room in cast iron pipes all round the abbey. And they put in iron gratings in the floor to let the heat rise to warm the church. And then to maximize the seating in the abbey, Scott was asked to put in as many pews as possible, which meant putting in a wooden platform onto which the pews were fixed. Because the stone floor was so uneven, you couldn't rest any pews on it at all. Sadly, all this work and all this weight meant that by the late 20th century, it was clear the floor was beginning to subside. What was needed was to lift the floor stones, dig out the unstable infill, and replace it with a solid foundation on which to relay the historic ledger stones, leaving a flat, stable, and beautiful floor. Reinstating the ledger stones, by the way, was essential. They with the memorial tablets on the walls of the Abbey, are the Abbey's heritage USP. We have more than any other church in Britain, including Westminster Abbey. There are 891 on the floor and a further 635 on the walls. They are fundamental to our heritage. But a nice new floor wasn't all we wanted from the project. We wanted more space to do all the things we would like to do for our visitors, whether tourists or worshippers. But we faced the same difficulty that had made earlier generations bury their dead under the floor. The church is surrounded by public realm. So the only place we could put our new facilities was underground. So our architects proposed that we use the space under the pavement on the south side of the abbey, in the basement of the row of houses in Kingston buildings, which conveniently the abbey owned, and the basement of abbey chambers. That would create space for a learning center, an interpretation center, a kitchen, toilets, a secure archive room, as well as good facilities for our wonderful choirs. At the same time, and bearing in mind the need for more sustainable energy efficiency, we decided to try to harness the energy of the hot spring water to heat the abbey. Now, Bartholians will be aware that over a million liters 
of seriously hot water, 40 degrees, comes out of the ground every day, and it all used to go down the drain, literally the Roman drain. This plan shows the, uh, the path of the drain out to the river. And the point at which we are taking some of the uh, heat, number four on the plan, you may be able to read the reference to energy blades. Think of a radiator. Hot water flowing through a radiator heats the colder air surrounding it. Here, the hotter water is on the outside, and some of the heat is transferred to the cooler water inside the blades. The blades themselves are immersed in the drain water, of course. What, what you can see here uh, are the pipes carrying the cold water to the drain and the now heated water back to the abbey to run under the, uh, under the new floor. Simple in theory, but with significant consequences. Now, fortunately, I don't have time to give you detail of the trials and tribulations involved in getting all the permissions, but we were eventually given the go-ahead and a National Lottery Heritage Fund grant of about 10 million pounds, roughly half the cost of the project. Work began in May 2018. And the floor repairs in the Abbey were done in three phases so that the church could continue to be used rather than closed for the duration. Now, I'd like to show you a film to give you some idea of how complex the project was and to introduce some of the contractors who were responsible for its delivery. Um, it's supposed to go. Ah. Work on Bath Abbey's footprint project started in earnest in 2018, after over a decade of planning. Supported by the National Lottery Heritage Fund, the project cost £21 million and successfully stabilised the Abbey's floor, which was in danger of collapse. New facilities were added, including a discovery centre, learning room and song school for choirs to rehearse in. A groundbreaking heating system using the overflow warm water from the Roman baths was created. Bath Abbey is now fit for purpose to continue its mission living and telling the good news of Jesus Christ to the congregation local and international visitors, and new audiences. In this film, we asked the key people involved in the project's conservation, design and construction strands to reflect on their involvement. Please, can you explain how you and your organisation were involved in the Footprint Project? FCB Studios has been involved with the Bath Abbey Footprint Project for over 10 years now, from the inception of the project to the development of the object objectives and right the way through the, the funding process, app approvals process and construction through to completion on site and it's been an incredible um, project for us to be involved with in our hometown of Bath. I joined the project at the start of 2020 when we were already two years into the construction phase of the work and as project director my role is to try and bridge the gap between the contractors and the consultants who are delivering the project on a daily basis and the end users, the congregation, the clergy and the staff at the Abbey who will be using the, the buildings, the facilities for many years to come. My name's Henry Pinder, I work for Man Williams and Man Williams were the civil and structural engineers for the project. So we were responsible for working alongside the architects to develop the technical aspects of the design and how it was going to be built. My name's Neil Francis and I work for an engineering consultancy called Bureau Hackold. 
We were the mechanical and electrical engineers on the Abbey Footprint Project, so responsible for the, the new sustainable heating, the ventilation, things like the lighting, the electrics, and so on, and also things like the energy efficiency measures incorporated into the building. Westlinks Archaeology were commissioned to uh, deal with the archaeology at the Footprint Project. So this meant um, what you normally understand as archaeology, the below ground stuff, but also the buildings themselves, which were recorded before the, the work started. Um, we'd then excavate certain areas and also monitor the contractors' work where they were digging into the ground and where necessarily getting to stop for a minute so we could record what was there and then hand back over for them to carry on doing their work. We were approached by Brewer Happold six, seven years ago um, to look at the projects they'd got so far in working out how to get energy out of the, the water in the Great Drain, um, but had sort of ruled out some options, had some options, and they wanted some, some practical advice on what would work and what wouldn't work, and also what else might be out there. We were able to identify the Energy Blade as a product that might be suitable uh, for the energy abstraction. We looked at it with them, we did some modelling, we got a test sample actually installed in the, in the Roman baths to see what happened with the, with the water quality. And ultimately we ended up with a bespoke design for the energy blades that took into account the access, etc. So my name is Samuel Clayton, I'm site manager for Sally Strachey Historic Conservation. Uh, we uh, were tasked with surveying the floor stone by stone and recording it lifting the, the floor, um, then conserving it in a workshop that was built on site, uh, stone by stone, and then, uh, and then relaying as per the very intricate drawings that we were issued. So I was one of the site managers for Emory Brothers Limited, who were the main contractor for the Abbey Footprint Project. We started on site in May 2018, and we finished in the autumn of 2021. Were there any challenges? And if so, how did you tackle them? We had the works within the Abbey itself and the, um, the uh, repairs of the Abbey floor. And uh, we had the works within the vaults, which we're in, we're in now, to transform them into new facilities for the Abbey. And then we had the, the transformation of Kingston buildings into new choir facilities and offices for the Abbey. And on top of that, we had the works within the Great Drain, where we're using the um, the water from the, um, the springs in, here in Bath to create a renewable energy source that the Abbey are using to heat all their buildings. On a project of this scale, obviously there are lots of unknowns, there are lots of challenges, and there are so many different aspects to the project. Um, some elements are completely new where we're, we're working with new technology um, and it, we really are on a very steep learning curve. There are other aspects um, to do with conservation and archeology, span obviously lots of unknown factors in that. Um, so one of the key challenges has been um, steering the project, keeping it within time, keeping it within budget. Um, they are always the key, the key um, drivers for a project of this size and scale. There were all sorts of challenges in this project, right the way through from the conceptual stages where we had to, for example, work out what was going wrong with the Abbey floor, um, what our options were in terms of uh, reconfiguring the vaults and the adjacent buildings, then through the uh, development of those designs where we had to come up with solutions which were sensitive to the historic fabric, which worked not just from an engineering point of view, but for everyone else who had an interest in the building, archaeologists, historians, and, and, and so forth. Um, and finally to come up with solutions which really could be built uh, in a pragmatic and cost-effective way, often entailing very gingerly holding up parts of the existing uh, building and the existing structures while putting, trying to put new structure in or under them. From an engineering point of view, the biggest single challenge was the sustainable heating system. So the Abbey has a really quite innovative heating system using the hot spring water that rises naturally in Bath. It, it rises in the Roman baths right next to Bath Abbey and it flows down a, a drain. The temperature is about 40 degrees, so a nice bath temperature. 
And uh, we spent a lot of time research, a lot and lot of years and years of upfront work, research, investigations, working out solutions and ways of getting the heat from that drain into the abbey. And we eventually settled on the idea of using metal plates called energy blades, which are laid out in, in, a, in a line in the drain itself under the streets of Bath. And the heat is taken from those and transferred into the abbey via uh, heat pumps, uh, underfloor heating, and so on. So that, that by far is the single biggest challenge. So from an archaeological point of view, uh, the footprint project was incredibly challenging. The archaeology was complicated, the construction was complicated, and meshing the two together was really complicated. Um, we had large numbers of workers on site, um, both ours and theirs. They're working for tight timescales and trying to mesh our work with theirs um, was complicated. Um, we quite often find ourselves working in um, very tight corners in amongst loads of scaffolding um, with loud construction noises going on everywhere, kango hammers and all sorts of things, um, whilst doing very delicate archaeological work in between. Um, but we got there and, um, yeah, it was, it was tricky, but um, ultimately very rewarding. The main challenge was access to the, to the Great Drain. Uh, the Great Drain is seven metres underneath the street, um, streets of Bath, and the only access for it was a, a manhole cover um, in the street. So everything was very limited in terms of what you get in and out, be that materials and labour. Um, and our guys were working down there in, in 30, 35 degree heat at 90% humidity. Um, so they could only work down there for 20, 30 minutes at a time before they had to come out and have a rest break and get fresh air. So access and working environment in the Great Drain was the, was the main issue. The challenges uh, for me and myself personally uh, were the level of recording and surveying that was uh, performed on the, uh, the, um, on the stonework of the floor just over 2,000 ledger stones within the floor. So anything from a, a very small stones uh, to uh, sort of a metre by two metre large uh, ledger stones were given equal weight within the survey and were logged and any information that was thrown up during the conservation works to those stones uh, were then logged within that survey uh, along with uh, the inscriptions and that, uh, the sort of physicalities of each stone. The, um, it was an enormous, uh, it was an enormous piece of work to undertake. There were many challenges during the course of the project. Uh, I was site managing on the Abbey floor, which was, and the work there was split into four phases. Uh, during phase one, we uncovered some lead coffins below ground that we had to uh, that we had to deal with, and that was a, an unexpected. We also discovered that the organ was poorly founded and a new system of support needed to be designed for that. Uh, then in phase two, we had the Montague tomb work. Um, we then implemented the organ work, so we had a duration where uh, the support system for the organ was designed and agreed. Um, and during phase two, we then implemented that to support the organ. And then finally in phase three, we had the Waller tomb, which was poorly founded. Um, a new foundation beam was, was installed to support that. And once all the floor was down and we were installing the corporation stalls, we, that was quite a challenge, piecing together essentially a, a big jigsaw of, of all these ornate pews that we'd removed some three years earlier. Were there any surprising or unexpected events? I think the one thing that sticks in my mind is the discovery of the Mason's Mark of William Virtue. And he, William Virtue with his brother um, were stonemasons in the 15th century and they were attributed with the um, the fan vaulting at the east end of the abbey, which is world famous. And <clears throat> during one of the lockdowns, I was on site and the archaeologist uncovered the mason's mark, which is a mark in the stone made by the masons to, to signify that it was their work. And um, the mason's mark of William Virtue was uncovered, um, which is incredible uh, because it, it tells you that what you've seen in the books about the man who helped create the abbey 500 years ago is true because you can see his signature effectively on the stonework. The most surprising event I think for everybody involved was when we finally excavated underneath the what is currently the shop within the um, Jackson extension to create um, what we now know as the, the Discovery Centre. Um, when we excavated um, beneath all of the Victorian layers and the Georgian layers we discovered 
um, the terraced houses that were built up against the side of the abbey. And that basement level, um, which is the same level now people are walking on, we actually had the basement walls there, we had the fireplaces all perfectly intact, as if somebody had just left the room. Um, the plaster can still be seen on the buttresses of the abbey. So I think that was quite a, a surprising discovery, and particularly where we, we were able to walk on um, the original Georgian pavement that was still in place. There were all sorts of surprises as we went along. Um, lots of uh, archaeological remains, of course, particularly to, um, in, the, in the vaults. Lots of exciting things uncovered under the uh, abbey floor as well. But in particular, um, the extent of the voids under the abbey floor was um, a surprise. And the lack of support directly under some of the heavy objects on the floor. So these are things like the organ loft, the Montague tomb, Lady Jane Waller tomb, the Chantry Chapel at the East End. These we thought would probably have their own foundations because we knew the slab wasn't very well supported. But in all cases, they weren't. They were just built off this slab, which in turn had uh, holes in the ground underneath it. So we had to find ways to hold all those things up or keep them in place um, delicately while we took away Gilbert Scott's lab and put in our new, uh, our new structure. The most surprising events were involved the floor, all the works in the ground. So the floor excavations, the excavations in the vaults, and generally the constant discovery of archeology span throughout. So discovering burials, the bodies, um, buried Roman remains, monuments, ash pits, there's all sorts of things discovered archeologically. So it does have an impact on my area of work as mechanical electrical engineer in that everything that's buried in the floor has to then be either rerouted or redirected somewhere. So there was a constant coordinating with the contractor and with the architect and the structural engineer in, in reworking things as the design progressed and developed. So, um, the footprint project from an archaeological point of view was full of surprises at every turn. Um, it's difficult to pick out one or two. Um, there's two, two things that do spring to mind immediately. Um, I got a call uh, from one of our workers while I was uh, working down in the vaults. I said, I think there's something you need to look at. Went up to the abbey and there were 20 people gathered around a hole. And in the bottom of the hole was a beautiful medieval encaustic tile pavement. Um, multicolored and stunning. The other uh, quite incredible thing we found was a bit more of a slow burner. Um, we started finding curving bits of stonework uh, above the Roman deposits and below the medieval deposits. And we started to get a hint that this might be part of the Saxon archeology, span part of the Saxon buildings. But it took quite a while to, to sort of settle down and be able to prove this. Once we'd worked out what it was, which is part of the Saxon monastery, um, that is really quite a big news story for the, for the project in general. Uh, the most surprising was that at the end of phase two, we had uh, COVID that hit, and that threw up a lot of um, sort of technical challenges in terms of how we managed the site and how we managed the team and how, uh, uh, especially because we had such a small amount of space. Um, um, and the, uh, the degradation of the marble inlays was another sort of surprising uh, issue that arose whilst uh, during the, the project. Just the, um, the level of, uh, of conservation that, that each one needed and how uh, involved that became was quite dramatic. Something that wasn't unexpected but came as a surprise and was, was quite new to us was the amount of human, human remains in the abbey floor. Uh, we were at hand, excavating by hand the abbey floor um, in order to stabilise it um, once we'd removed the ledger stones. Um, it was always a shock to, to the team that we assembled um, to do the excavation work because they're essentially digging into human remains, bone, fragments of bone, um, where people have been buried and the burials have been disturbed previously. It was a surprise to me how quickly people became used to working in that environment, working inside an abbey where people have been buried hundreds of years before. Um, but we knew it was for a good reason, to stabilise the floor and to secure it for the future. 
Uh, those bones were put to one side by the team of archaeologists we were working with from Wessex Archaeology. They catalogued and sorted through those bones, recorded them, photographed them. Uh, they were then boxed and we took them from the Abbey and interred them at the Abbey Cemetery in Bath. What do you think will be the lasting benefits or achievements of the project from your perspective? I haven't got time to show you all the rest. They're, of course, um, very proud of what they've done, and rightly so. So they should be. Um, there's so much in there. Oh, no, next one. There's so much in there that I would, uh, would love to talk about, but I must stick to my brief. But before we go back to that, can I just say that I am very pleased that the project has received several reward, uh, awards. Sorry. One of uh, the uh, aspects with which we are most pleased is that we were able to use the skills of local people so much. The size and cost of the project meant that in the National Lottery uh, Heritage Fund's terms, we were a national as opposed to a regional or a local project. And therefore, we were required to put contracts out to tender on a Europe-wide basis. This was, of course, all long before the evils of Brexit. Nevertheless, we were delighted to be able to award contracts on merit to local companies. So. Emery Brothers, the main contractors, Synergy as project managers, Bureau Happold and Mann Williams as consultants, and Wessex Archaeology to ensure compliance with the terms of our various faculties, licenses, and permissions. This is the reality of being at the heart of the city, and it has been immensely satisfying to partner with local businesses in this way. And if I might just slip in a, a bit of an advertisement for another example of such cooperative working arising out of our Memorial Stones USP. This is our partnership with Bath Preservation Trust and Bath Record Office in the Bath and Colonialism Archive Project for which we have been given funding from the National Archives. There will be other joint enterprises, I have no doubt. Now, if that's an example uh, from the heritage side of our dual existence, we are, of course, in permanent partnership on the religious side because of our place in the structure of the Church of England, where we are part of Bath Deanery, Bath Archdeaconry, the Diocese of Bath and Wells, the province of Canterbury, and the global Anglican Communion, as well as more informally as ecumenical partners with local churches of other denominations. This embedding of Bath Abbey in the hierarchy of the Church of England has an important bearing on the financial workings of the Abbey, because the Abbey is not an independent financial entity. It pays what is called a parish share into the common fund of the Diocese of Bath and Wells. The common fund is, in effect, the annual budget of the diocese, amounting to over £15 million in 2023. On the expenditure side, there is the cost of providing those clergy who receive a stipend, it's not a salary. And when on the costs, housing, pensions, training, etc., are added, that comes to 10.9 million pounds, or 69.4% of total costs. That is balanced by the fact that on the income side, 69% of diocesan income derives from the parish shares. Now, since parish share is calculated on the basis of per capita membership of congregations, modified by a self-assessed socioeconomic factor, 
which is supposed to represent ability to pay, but which in fact represents something closer to willingness to pay. You would expect Bath Abbey, which has the highest membership of any parish church in the diocese, to pay relatively more than many others for uh, its parish share. In fact, the parish share asked of Bath Abbey is by some way the highest ask of any church in the diocese at almost £328,000. For comparison, the next highest parish share is £186,000. In fact, Bath Deanery as a whole, the 31 Church of England parishes in the city and surrounding villages, pays a fraction under £1.8 million to the diocese. This must inevitably affect the ability of all our parishes to partner community groups and charities to meet the needs of people in Bath. Now, I mention all this to you because you'll see at once that it has a huge impact on the Abbey's finances. Essentially, our income derives from two sources matching our two areas of activity, from the congregation and from our visitors. Now, I don't need to tell this audience that the last three years have had a seriously harmful effect on income from tourism, with the result that Bath Abbey, quite honestly, has struggled to make ends meet. We have no historic endowments. Our only reserves come from the excess of income over expenditure in the years where there has been an excess of income over expenditure. So although the footprint project has been complete, completed and concluded within budget, no small achievement, I think you'll agree, we are not in a comfortable position financially. And that's the reason why we have reluctantly taken the decision to charge tourists to visit the Abbey and not to rely on charming them into making a voluntary contribution. I don't know what it says about our charm, but the contrast is stark. We were getting an average donation of somewhere between £1.80 and £1.90 per visitor. Now we are charging a modest £6.50 ahead. I say modest, that's in comparison with other heritage attractions. It'll cost you rather more than that to get into Westminster Abbey, but perhaps I shouldn't mention that. We are able to exempt anyone living in BA1 or BA2. After all, if the Abbey really is at the heart of the city and community, we believe that people should be able to come to their Abbey without charge. And we're also making arrangements for people who only wish to come to light a candle or offer a prayer. And for those who do have to pay, we have improved the quality of their experience. They can have a guided tour of the Abbey or a tower tour without pre-booking. And they can visit the new Discovery Centre where there is a range of displays, some interactive, in illustrating the history of the Abbey from the foundation of the convent under the Abbess Bertana in AD 676. So, the Abbey has been renovated, a financial recovery plan has been put in place, and we are now ready for the big challenge for the rest of the current decade, the ambition to achieve net carbon, net zero carbon by 2030, a full 20 years ahead of government targets. The goal is one which we wholeheartedly support, of course, but we didn't make the decision, I'll be perfectly honest, we didn't make the decision to set it for ourselves. It was set for us. The Church of England took the bold step in July of last year of aiming for net zero carbon by 2030. It is, 
let's be honest, a challenging target. But the climate crisis is both important and urgent, and the church needs to give a lead in tackling it. I could refer you to a 50-page root map from the Church of England at national level, or to the Diocese of Bath and Wells Environment and Climate Change Rolling Action Plan, but I'll spare you the small print and the pretty pictures. Both documents are available online, and of course I haven't printed them off, have I? All this means that we are not short of good advice or enthusiastic advocacy. But how are we at the Abbey getting on with the task? I've made much of the plan uh, to reduce our use of gas very significantly by taking energy from the hot spring to power our underwater heating. It's such a good idea that I understand the Roman baths are adopting it to heat the premises of their new uh, archway project. But that's not the only energy efficient aspect of the footprint project. We are now, of course, using LED or energy saving lights in all areas. And although that seems ridiculously obvious, the Abbey has actually taken a long time to bring its lighting up to date. As part of the modernization of the church in the 1860s, new roof, new heating, new seating, there was also new lighting. George Gilbert Scott introduced gas lighting to replace the chandeliers. And he used devices called gasoliers. Chandeliers are properly speaking, if I can be pedantic for a moment, only for candles. Commission from Francis Skidmore of Coventry, perhaps the best known craftsman in the country for his metalwork, and along with Scott, with whom he frequently collaborated, a leading proponent of the Gothic revival movement, these gasoliers had mantles fitted to the end of the hollow pipes, and they burned gas to produce light. I'm old enough to remember quite similar arrangements in caravan holidays in the 1950s. Now, as well as the two rows of them down the whole length of the church with which you may be familiar, there was also, as you might be able to see from the middle image, an enormous one hanging from the crossing under the tower. That disappeared around the time of the First World War. But remarkably, the others were still in use, still gas-powered, until 1978. Only in that year were they converted by the simple expedience of feeding electric cable down the pipe uh, and fitting a bulb on the end. Now, although we have retained and refurbished the metalwork, all the light in these X gasoliers now comes from LEDs. And that too represents another carbon saving. So where do we go from here? Well, the, or, the Abbey already has a Green Tourism Bronze Award and has enrolled in the Eco Church program in which it has achieved a Bronze Award. Bronze Awards are very nice, but of course, they give you the incentive to go further up the ladder. What does it mean? The Eco Church scheme is operated by Arosha, a Christian charity, I quote, working to protect and restore the natural world and committed to equipping Christians and churches in the UK to care for the environment. Arosha UK is part of the international Arosha network of Christian organizations in more than 20 countries and in six continents. The Eco Church scheme provides a framework to support churches and their leadership to take practical action on caring for the planet. It includes a toolkit of resources, an online audit survey to let you know how well you're getting on, and its own suite of supporting resources. 
Bath Abbey received the bronze award last year and is working towards the silver level. Will it be enough to reach net zero carbon in the next seven years? Well, I have to be honest and say that the task would be somewhat easier if some of the restrictions were eased. England has 14,500 listed places of worship, 4,000 of them, like Bath Abbey, at grade one. 45% of all grade one listed buildings are places of worship. The rules for doing any kind of work on these are very restrictive. And given the urgency of the need for change, I think there needs to be some serious change soon in the whole approach to authorizing adaptations to buildings in the interests of combating climate change. What about rainwater harvesting? The volume of water that lands on the abbey roofs in prolonged heavy rain is simply too great for the hoppers and the downpipes to manage. So there is damage to ancient stonework caused by cascades of overflowing water. And when the water does reach ground level by whatever means, it simply runs away into the drains. What about solar panels on roofs? It cannot be beyond the wit of man to make solar panels that would blend inconspicuously with the lead. If changing restrictive regulation is a medium to long-term change, what are the short-term gains, the low-hanging fruit? The Arusha Eco Church Survey suggests several. There are five areas that are assessed before a church can qualify for an award. Worship and teaching, management of church buildings, management of church land, if you have any, community and global engagement, and lifestyle. What can be done? Well, worship and teaching is an easy win. Those of us who believe that the earth, indeed the whole cosmos, is God's creation, for us there is an urgent moral imperative to act. And as a prelude to action, there is a need to underline the urgency. Churches must preach and teach about the climate emergency, and not simply once a year at the Harvest Festival service. An informed and committed congregation is essential to raise awareness in the community at large. As regards church buildings, and by that I mean halls and offices as well as worship centres, Bath Abbey owns five grade two townhouses in Kingston buildings. The first step is to measure current energy use so that targets for achieving energy efficiency and reducing emissions can be smart targets. And research into ethical and effective offset schemes should be done for the things that we cannot reduce. Green sources of electricity, for example, can be investigated. I hardly dare mention double glazing for Bath Abbey. But if that is an inconceivably big project, what about the small ones? Bath Abbey is now able to offer toilet facilities. Well, hey. And the new toilets must have water-saving devices fitted to the cisterns. But why not eventually use harvested rainwater to fill the cisterns? What about our consumables? Churches are notorious producers of paper. We need to make it the responsibility of someone on the staff to monitor paper usage and suggest ways in which it can be reduced. We have already replaced our printed uh, ab weekly news sheet with an electronically distributed Abbey Community News with only enough printed copies for those who have not got or cannot get access to the electronic one. We haven't any land around our church. I refer you to the previous remarks about burying people under the floor. 
quite why it was a surprise to Felix Emery, I can't imagine. But we have got a cemetery, though we don't bury people there anymore either. That's full. The Abbey uh, Cemetery has been declared closed because it's full, and its maintenance is now the responsibility of the local authority. So there's another opportunity for partnership. And I'm pleased to say that with the enthusiastic support of the admirable Whitcomb Association, the Abbey Cemetery is now a green space for community recreational use and nature conservation. The last two areas assessed are about our engagement with the community, both local and global, and the lifestyle of our own people. Are we practicing what we preach? Are we, as individuals, prepared to put ourselves out for the sake of the planet? There's a lot we can do in our homes, in the way we get around the city, in our shopping and eating habits, the holidays we take. And I can say, I hope with uh, modest satisfaction, that at least once a month, there is a feature article in the Abbey Community News to try to make people think about green issues and to suggest practical ways to modify our lifestyles to make us more environmentally aware. Members of the Abbey's Eco Group write about their ideas and experiences, and there's regular information about community groups which Abbey folk can join and support. There are pointers to other groups such as Transition Bath. And I guess that in, in the business of fending off climate catastrophe, as in so many spheres of activity, it's the networking that counts putting like-minded people in touch with each other so as to encourage both parties and enhance the impact of their actions. That may not sound much, but in the face of national government's appalling and culpable blindness to the problem and pusillanimous indifference to the solutions, any institution that can spread the word and share good practice among individuals is doing all that can be asked of it. Which brings us back neatly to the idea of Bath Abbey being at the heart of the city and therefore well-placed to network, collaborate and partner with individuals and organizations which share our concerns. And a reduction in carbon emissions is certainly one of those concerns and an urgent one at that. Thank you very much for listening. Wow. What a role model of a business then. 15 million pound business. Doing its very best. Thank you so much. Right, the floor is open to questions. Also those on Zoom, if you'd like to unmute yourselves and ask questions, you're very welcome. But if you would also like to feed them in via the chat, that would be good. What have you got for us, John? Nothing yet. Nothing yet. That's good. What, that's right. here. Betty. Oh, let me give you a microphone. And if everybody can hear me. Right. If you speak into the microphone, everybody on Zoom can hear you too. Thanks to lovely Joel here. Thank you. Can we access the memorials, the, the information on the memorials uh, via the internet? Um, the honest answer is not all, not yet. We are working on it. Um, Again, for financial reasons, it's something that is being done by volunteers. Um, we have constant, we have concentrated on the the, the issue of Bath and colonialism, um, the the links with you know, Black Lives Matters, Black Lives Matter two three years ago, um, propelled us into starting there, but it is the uh, definitely the intention 
to, to get as much of the information available online as possible. I would think there's actually a link between the memorials and Black Lives Matter. Oh, yes. <laughs> oh, yes. Um, I, I, could, I could talk for hours. Um, I shan't, I promise. Um, <laughs> the, what you carve on your, um, your memorial tablets is very interesting. Um, and the people who say, um, I, I'll, I'll quote you one. There's, um, there's a lady, uh, the, the only daughter of Jeremiah Riley of Liverpool and Riley's in Jamaica. Uh-uh. Yes, you say, mm, I, I bet I know what Riley's in Jamaica was. And yes, it was a plantation. Um, and uh, Jeremiah Riley's daughter benefited hugely from the, uh, the produce of the enslaved people there. Um, when she died uh, in a, oh, 1820, give or take five years, my memory is not what it used to be, she was able to, oh, she did a lot of good work with it. She left a thousand pounds to um, to a hospital in Liverpool, two thousand pounds to an asylum in Liverpool, fifty pounds to the Royal United Hospital, and a thousand pounds to the Society for the Propagation of the Christian Knowledge. Um, so you you top that up, and and she was worth a bob or two, and we know where it came from. The interesting ones are the ones where they don't mention it, um, but. I, I mustn't get in, into my anecdotage. Jeremy, thank you very much indeed for that splendid lecture, which I'm sure we all enjoy very much, if enjoy is the right word. Um, one issue that I'm very interested in is in the putting in of solar panels. We lived in a house until two years ago for many years, and I managed to get... I'm not patting myself on the back, I hope, here, but we did manage to get 16 solar panels installed on the roof. Um, I have heard it said by others than yourself that it is not easy. In fact, some have said it's impossible to get solar panels installed on the roof of Bath Abbey. Uh, is it really, do you think, possible to get solar panels installed there? Because that is quite a large space we're looking at there, which is whitish in that picture. And uh, it would be an enormous thing if it could be, but uh, other people than yourself have told me that it, it is a very difficult thing to do. Have you any comments on that? Um, yes. Um, and uh, if there are any members of the Diocesan Advisory Committee uh, watching this, I hope they'll forgive me. Ecclesiastical build Church of England buildings, um, I must be careful what I say, I honestly don't know whether it applies to non-Anglican buildings, but Church of England church buildings are exempt from local authority planning regulations. Uh, en revanche, as we would say, um, on the other hand, they are subject to faculty jurisdiction to do anything, certainly, you know, grew something into the wall <clears throat> uh, to do anything that involves the fabric of the church requires a faculty um, in theory from the chancellor of the diocese the chancellor of the diocese is is a uh, a legal officer they're they're all qcs and goodness knows what um and the Chancellor is ad, uh, advised by the DAC, the Diocesan Advisory Committee, that, that their role is to say to the Chancellor, um, since somebody or others down by the marsh uh, wants to put up um, an electric light in the vestry so the vicar can see what he's doing, is that all right? And they say, whoa, I don't know, how many screws are they going to put into the fabric? Um, the people represented on the DAC, yes, the three archdeacons are uh, members. They represent, if you like, the missional uh, intent. But the other members are heritage people, including, and I, I mustn't get carried away, 
the uh, such groups as the Victorian Society. Now, the Victorian Society exists to preserve anything and everything that is Victorian. I said I didn't have time to talk to you about the process of getting permission to do the floor. It's blindingly obvious that you can't repair the floor in the church without taking out all the furniture first. So we had to take out all those pews that Gilbert Scott put in in 1860. The question was, did we want to put them back or not? We thought it would be advantageous because of flexibility of seating um, and, and all sorts of ways um, to have chairs and not pews in the Abbey. We petitioned the Chancellor through the advisory committee to get permission not to put back the pews in the nave. We heard, heard Felix talking about putting back the corporation stalls in the chancel, um, the, his, his famous 3D jigsaw puzzle. It took a consistory court, which cost the Abbey a hundred thousand pounds, to get a judgment from the Chancellor that not putting back the Victorian pews was not an act of vandalism directed at desecrating the, the good name of George Gilbert Scott. That, that is an actual example. Now, you asked about solar panels. The precedent is that churches that have approached uh, their DAs, um, there's, one, there's one in every diocese. Um, so so the, I, I'm not guessing at uh, them at Wells. Um, every diocese has one, and they're, they're, they're set up in the same way. But the, the poor archdeacon uh, is invited to argue the case for a change, and then the argument is uh, is <laughs> countered, shall we say, by the people. Oh, you can't do that. Or this is vandalism. You're destroying this, that, and and the, and the other. Um, we managed to prove that George Gilbert Scott had vir personally had virtually nothing to do with the the nave pews. He didn't design them. Um, the uh, we discovered the drawings, the top one of which had been signed off. The, everything else in the pile had been done by somebody else. He, he sent his apprentices round Somerset to, to, to draw things that were then machine carved until the pew ends. The pews themselves were third rate. If you your first rate pews are English oak, second rate pews are imported oak, third rate pews are pine. Ours were pine. Um, but but we had to go through this process. Now, the um the precedent is that churches who have asked to install solar panels have had the uh, the request turned down. And it's turned down on the grounds that it will spoil the view. Now, um, I imagine that, that, that if you have a, uh, a church uh, with, a, with, a, with a, a, a steep roof um, visible from all round, uh, and you put certain types of solar panels on it less than carefully, then there, there might be a vis visual impact. But as you can probably see, the pitch of the abbey roofs is, is quite shallow. There is a parapet all the way around, so you cannot see that roof from ground level. You can't even see it for if you um, sat on the top of the guild hall, um, and I don't suppose you've ever sat on the top of the guild hall, but um, would passing helicopter pilots, oh, and of course, hot air balloon passengers, really object to solar panels? I don't know anything about solar panels, but I would be astonished if they couldn't be colored gray to match the lead. Um, 
Why ever not? It is going to need somebody with the clout and a fairly deep purse, like Bath Abbey <laughs> used to have, <laughs> um, not sure about the deep purse these days, that will take on some of these um, amenity societies and say, it's all very well saying you'll spoil the view of a 19th century, uh, or well, not in our case, uh, 15th century grade one listed building. If we don't achieve net zero, if we are still wondering what we can do in a hundred years time, there won't be anybody left to admire the view or not. Um, I, 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 I'm talking to the committee, aren't I? I, mean, I, I, I know. Um, it, it, is, it is very uh, worrying that we have left it. So, and, and quite honestly, there is so little leadership. Do you know, Parliament is far more excited about what the General Synod of the Church of England is saying about same blessing same-sex marriages than it is about getting solar panels on roofs of churches. I think I think I'm going to stop there. <laughs> but something that may come from our hope is our last speaker was Rob Delius, the architect, and he'd had a problem with uh, putting solar panels on his grade one, two listed house. And so he devised some that looked like tiles and he managed to get permission. He's also very interested in your footprint project and wants to put in a swimming pool with heated water connected to your system in somewhere in North Bray Gardens-ish. I don't know if any of you are here, but he showed it last speech. Yeah. Um, right. So we'll let you um, have a look at the video of that, which Joel sent to the right person, and we should be able to find the link. And uh, hope that that is fruitful ground for getting the Abbey fully solared. It, it, will, it will be wonderful. It, re it really would be, be deeply significant. Um, there, is, there is more scope for taking energy out of the uh, the spring water. Um, the, the lovely people at ISO and, and uh, Bureau Happold um, have done lots of calculations. Um, we are taking very little in, in ter I'm going to show my ignorance here. Is it kilowatt hours or something? <laughs> Thank you. Or, uh, uh, very little of the available energy. Um, there's plenty left for the Roman baths. There's plenty more for people down York Street. Um, they, they say under the streets of Bath. It's York Street. <laughs> um, the, uh, you, saw, you saw in the plan where it goes. Um, if I could see if we can get there. Ta -da. Oops. That's it. Um, that, yes. uh, uh, number, number eight. Mm -hmm. Outlet into the River Avon, 30 degrees centigrade. There is still energy in that when it goes out into the river. Of course, it's tough on the carp who like swimming around in the hot water, but um, you know, needs must. Um, so, so there are places where more energy could be taken out of that. Yes, that number eight is where he wanted to put these, the swimming pool, I think. There we are. Huh? Something to look forward to. Yes. Question on a slightly different subject. Um, one use of the building you haven't talked about is the entertainment. The <laughs> festival has several concerts and things there. And I wonder how that fits in with your plans and um, general use of the building. Yes, um, that that is... Uh... I, I talked about a, a crossover between what are clearly heritage activities and clearly religious. The, the musical concerts are, are a kind of hybrid. Um, we, we are happy to, to let people use Bath Abbey. There is a cost involved. Um, we, we, <laughs> we, we have to give them what we call vergers and anyone else would call security staff. <laughs> Uh, we have to pay them overtime if they're there. Um, a lot of concerts take place on Saturday evenings, and we really do like to have the church back to to be a church by eight o'clock Sunday morning. 
which means that there's some seriously antisocial hours for dismantling staging and, and so on. But it can be done, and we're happy to do it. Um, right now, literally this year, we are refurbishing our wonderful Kleiss organ. It is amongst the best organs in Britain. Um, it, uh, it wasn't <laughs> cellophane wrapped during footprints, so it, it has suffered a bit, but it was, it was due for, um, uh, it, it was installed about 25 years ago, so it was due for an overhaul. We're, we're doing that. Um, and, and that is a marvelous resource. So some of the concerts, uh, which are, are in-house, um, our own choir, uh, whether anyone went to the, the, the John Passion uh, last Wednesday, um, for a parish church choir, I think they did pretty well. Um, so, so yes, we, we are happy to do that. Though, as I say, there, there are little inconveniences about it. Jeremy, thank you so much for your talk. Um, and I share your frustration. I was a church warden of a great two star early medieval church that needed a new roof. Uh, and had to go through the pain of actually it was natural heritage, uh, not natural, English heritage and the National Lottery Heritage Fund, which pro produced part of the quarter million it cost to do it, who refused to let us put any insulation um, around the roof. In fact, we had to remove all the insulation in the church. I just wondered if you had managed to do anything with insulation, because just in the thinking about living in Bath anyway, in a insulation, you get preoccupied with insulation on days like this if you live in a Georgian building. <laughs> and I just wondered whether you'd managed any neat solutions? Um, no, is a short answer. But but it is but it is why uh, it was so attractive to put the um, uh, to put in underfloor heating from from a uh, a, a renewable source, um, because without that you're you're just just uh, it just escapes up. What happens um, in the Abbey, the, the windows are, um, I've forgotten what the figure is, for the percentage of wall space that is actually glass. Um, but it's, it's, it's something ridiculous, like 70%. Uh, and of course, the, the difference between the outside temperature and the, the inside temperature um, can be considerable. Uh, and what happens is that as the as the hot air rises past the window, it is cooled, and then it comes cascading downwards again <laughs> onto the unfortunate congregation below. Um, so uh, we were able to insulate below the the, uh, the heating pipes under the floor, um, but we have not. I said something. Supposedly jovial about double glazing the windows, but no, there's there's nothing like that. What there is, um, we we talk about uh, quite loosely about the fan vaulting as being the roof of the abbey. It's not. The fan vaulting is the ceiling, and above that is a quite separate roof. And there is there is a um, a vo you can crawl through. I mean, it's 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 not uniform height because because of the pitch of the roof. In the center, you you can almost walk upright. Out by the walls, you're crawling, but you can get into that void space. Um, it it has some insulation. It it has fire curtains. Um, the uh, the the fire brigade were desperately worried. Um, about fire spreading laterally through that area, particularly because that, that's where all the, um, the, the the electric cables are um, and the, the the PA system and all, and all that. Um, so um, it is it is divided off uh, by by heavy fireproof curtains, and they do act as some insulation. Um, so so yes, it's it's not all going up through the roof, but the windows are a. Uh, Dot 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 problem hazard. You know, hmm. Ruth. 
Just, just thinking about the windows, I mean, that would be quite tricky, wouldn't it, to have a form of double glazing because it would <laughs> pretty much ruin the effect of all the lovely stained glass, wouldn't it? I mean, or maybe there's a way around it. I'm not a scientist, but uh, um, but yeah, I, I can see a solution would be good, but it, it would be a shame if it uh, detracted from the beauty of the glass. Oh, it would It would be a, it'd be a crying shame. Um, and and that's that's where... Uh, human ingenuity ought to be directed. Um, you can, uh, I can imagine um, a, a layer of clear glass uh, inside. Would would that detract, or or maybe you put it outside? the The old idea about the Abbey being the lantern of the West. Well, there's there's so much light outside these days that you can't see the lantern from very far away. So so maybe you 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 fit the um the clear glass on the outside. Uh, yeah, I think that there is scope there for for somebody to do some thinking. Um, and and if we there there is some evidence that our our battle um, with the Victorian society over our pews has paved the way for other churches to be brave enough to say, do you know, we can, if you argue your case properly, you can make some progress. Um, and I, I can think of one church in the Midlands, uh, which was, uh, I'll use the word inspired, um, to go the same way. And and to quote our Chancellor's judgment, that um, I'm not in any sense um, attaching any blame to the Chancellor of the, the Diocese of Bath and Wells, who is a good man. He made the judgment in our favour. And he made it so effectively that when the Victorian society asked to leave to appeal against the judgment to a wonderful thing called the Court of Arches, uh, which is national level, uh, they were refused permission to appeal because the dean of the Court of Arches said he could see nothing wrong with the chancellor's argument uh, and his judgment whatsoever. It would be a waste of everybody's money. The only thing that was left to them then was to appeal to the Privy Council. Unfortunately, wisdom prevailed. Um, yes, I, I can see that uh, there are there are reasons for having people who will, who will keep an eye out. Um, <laughs> I, I suspect we've all heard of, we don't know them personally, we've all heard of uh, vicars who've gone and said, well, that'll have to go, and you know, get rid of that, well, we could put um, put a cafe in that corner and um, a jukebox in that corner. <laughs> um, so, so yes, to have some sort, but it has got to be a rational, thought-through process um, by which you argue your way to a wise decision. We still have in the chancel of Bath Abbey, ample examples of George Gilbert Scott's work. And it really is George Gilbert Scott, not some of his minions. And the fact that we haven't any in the nave, I, I, I want, I'm, I'm a historian, I'm a, um, I'm a heritage uh, fiend, uh, I, I love it. Um, but I am not remotely sorry that we didn't put them back. So I don't know whether that answers the question or not. <laughs> Any more questions here? No, I think not. Any on Zoom, Joel? Right. In that case, I think I'll swap places with you. Turn this off. And say again, thank you so much for leading such an inspirational charge into combating climate change and such an enormous business. I had no idea. The Abbey was that big and that it's leading by such a good example and we can link it up with all the organizations from the previous talks one of which you mentioned transition bath and we can put you in touch with rob delius and make this a united bath effort to combat climate change via business <laughs> Well, 
Following on from your excellent talk, next time, and I hope you'll come, we have a green stationery company by the founder and CEO who 30 years ago decided that he wanted to run a green business, that money wasn't going to be his target. And he's going to come and tell you all about that. And I hope you'll very much enjoy it and see what a green business that's been running for 30 years can look like. Thank you all very much.